This is DNA sequencing part two. Uh, and this uh, video, we're going to uh, look at how you go from uh, maybe determining the sequence of a stretch of DNA which was up to a thousand base pairs long to now look at how you can sequence a whole jolly genome. And that is the great difficulty because genomes are vast, they're huge. Human haploid genome, more than 3 billion base pairs long, and that is very clearly far too large uh, to just try to do in one sequence, in, in one bite, in one gulp, in one go. Well, uh, instead, you need to reduce bite size greatly, and we do that in two manageable stages. Um, Overall, this process is sometimes referred to as shotgun sequencing. Shotgun because shotguns tend to blow things apart into many, many smaller pieces. Uh, and then you put them back together again. And you find out what the overall sequence is by doing that. Step one of this is to make a chromosome map. You can make a chromosome map using gross features, easily identifiable features such as microsatellite locations. What is a microsatellite? Well, if you've watched the video on DNA profiling part one, uh, and I'll put a link to that below uh, this video on YouTube, then you will uh, know a fair bit about them already, and indeed you could uh, go to that video uh, after this and find out more if you are interested. But in essence, they are stretches, well, in the stretches we have between genes, um, very often you will find microsatellites and they are just repetitious sequences repetitious sequences uh, and you could have many many repeats just seemingly of random code and they're fairly easy to spot and they can give you a kind of gross map of your features of your chromosome. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a map of the UK, uh, you may be able to spot pretty quickly where there are mountains, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily know from a, uh, a map on that scale uh, what a street name was. And that's the sort of principle we're having here. You can easily find these microsatellites, even if you don't know uh, the sequences of the uh, uh, genes around them. So, Step two, and really this is the first time we break the thing up, so we break it down in two stages, but uh, here we go. Step two of this, um, shear the chromosome into 100 KBP sections. Those are pretty big sections, 100,000 base pairs, uh, and this is often done by uh, sonic shattering. Uh, that can just blast the thing apart, literally blast the thing apart uh, with sound energy. What you can then do is insert each section into a back, a bacterial artificial chromosome. Now once you've done that, you should know from the gross features, such as these microsatellites which we discussed, you should know which part of the chromosome is in each back. And that means you can label each back according to which part of which chromosome it contains. And that gives you a very specific record of which fragments of the chromosome are in which back. You then reinsert uh, those backs into a bacterium, one back per bacterium, and clone each bacterium separately. And this gives you a living library of backs for future reference. You've done this once, that's your library, you've got it. And of course, you can make as many copies of these backs as you choose simply by allowing the bacteria which carry that individual back to divide and replicate. Step three. Well, you've got to decide which part of the chromosome you want to sequence. So you select your target back. You culture your bacteria up, you take out the back DNA, and then you cut up your sample of uh, DNA from that back with a restriction enzyme. And then you would do it uh, on a second sample, third sample, uh, with a different restriction enzyme, uh, and so on. That gives you this kind of jigsaw puzzle of fragments. So each one of these lines going along here 
that line there, and then this third line here, and this fourth line here. Uh, those are all the same back. Um, the same back uh, with different cop copies of that same back, but uh, copies which have been chopped up with different restriction enzymes. And this means that, well, this bit of the back here has the same sequence as this here, and this bit here, and this bit here, and this bit here, etc. And then we find that we've got the backs uh, in different fragment lengths. And you can see that they overlap with each other as well. So this back here, um, now when you were doing this experimentally, you wouldn't know that it has a sequence or it has a fragment this length which overlaps with this one here. We're going to find that out later. Um, but we chop it off and clearly this bit will overlap with that, which will overlap with that. Carrying on on this step, we then separate these fragments by gel electrophoresis, back with our old friend gel electrophoresis, and we separate them according to size, with again the smallest one moving the furthest towards the positive electrode. We then sequence each fragment in the method we've described, because now, because we've done two stages of breaking up our chromosome, we've broken it down into manageable sizes. Uh, we can sequence each bit, which is if it's up to a, a thousand base pairs in length. And then we can just find out which bits overlap which with, un with which other bits. And uh, then you can put it together like a big jigsaw puzzle. And computers can do that to you. Uh, it can do that for you. Excuse me. <coughs> So what? Well, what can we use this for? Uh, indeed, what has been the big hype about the HGP, the Human Genome Project? It's cost an awful lot of money. It's taken a very long time, but we now uh, have and have had for a little bit, of, a little while now, uh, the complete sequence of the human genome. So what? It allows uh, a comparison of nucleotide sequences between different organisms. It will therefore tell you how closely related they are in evolutionary terms. It'll show you how important a gene is. If a gene has been highly conserved, uh, let's say you can remember Hox genes. Uh, Hox genes are very, very well conserved. That tells you that if mutations happen to them, they are weeded out very quickly they are selected against, which suggests that those genes are extremely biologically important and if you change their function it's pretty deleterious, it's bad news, it deletes function. You can use this to find out homologous genes in other species and then you can knock those out in those species allowing models to be made for human conditions. You can identify genes for pathogenicity, that is, how pathogenic something is, um, and then you can, by doing a comparison between pathogens and non-pathogenic relatives, you find out the genes they have in common, the genes they don't have in common, maybe the genes they don't have in common are, are the ones which are pathogenic, are the ones causing the harm. And so you can target your treatments and research appropriately. Diagnosis of genetic disease, uh, screening for cystic fibrosis or Tay-Sachs, that sort of thing, very important for uh, uh, genetic counselling and our old favourite DNA fingerprinting or DNA profiling in criminal forensics uh, and uh, paternity cases. Well, I hope that was helpful and interesting. Do pause, play, rewind, all that sort of stuff. Thank you.